Coming up next on Texas Parks and Wildlife, nursing sick or injured animals back to health is a demanding job with long hours and little or no pay. We'll take a look at the wildlife rehabilitators in Texas who dedicate their lives to returning these animals to the wild. On the Naturalist Journal, we'll look at one endangered species that lives in East Texas. We'll show you how the red cockaded woodpecker has been getting some help in finding a new home in the pines. The land on both sides of the Rio Grande from Laredo to Brownsville is rich with remnants of the past. This area has been designated a heritage corridor to preserve these cultural resources. We'll take you downriver on a trip through time. And finally, we'll experience Texas by looking at the rock art left behind by some of the earliest Texans. These stories are coming up next on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Parks and Wildlife Communications is Kathy. And it has a lot of ant bites or just a few? Okay, and what is your address so I can send a game warden over? You can sit it right over here on the Astro Tour. The Texas Parks and Wildlife Department has granted over 350 animal rehabilitation licenses to qualified applicants throughout the state. The license allows rehabilitators to legally work with injured, orphaned, or sick wild animals. And it's a buck. Rehabilitators take in all kinds of animals needing treatment, from a one-day-old fawn covered with fire ant bites to a featherless baby bird. This is a young chimney swift that came to us last night. It's two days of age. This bird fell from the nest, and a lady found him crawling across her carpet. There's some bruising on his face and his right toe is broken. He had quite a fall. We're guardedly optimistic at this time. This bird had a broken wing as a very young owl, and we had to run a steel pin through the wing to get everything to line up real well. Today is the day that the pin is, is going to be coming out. Not like Straight that. up that bone, huh? This prognosis is real good. This little bird is, is going to be very releasable. It's spring here in the Texas Hill Country, the season when white-tailed deer begin to give birth. And that's when rehabilitator Ann Connell is at her busiest, often caring for fawns only a day or two old. Most fawns that come in come because they have been stung by fire ants. When the fawns are being stung by the ants, about the only defense they have is to lick them off. And so they end up with hundreds of ants in their stomachs. We're finding that those ants, as they travel through the GI tract, end up dispersing their poisons. And so when the fawn first comes in, we do actually pump their stomach, like someone with a drug overdose would have done in the emergency department. And we pump the stomach, we try to get as many ants out as possible, as soon as possible, to decrease the general uh, poison release throughout their system. Yeah, look at those ants. See those black things? Yeah. Get those ants out of there. It's okay, it's okay. As soon as the fawns are healthy enough to drink milk from a bottle on their own, they are introduced to the bottle rack. The minimal human contact ensures that they remain wild. And the wilder they are, the greater their chance of survival. 
when you really think about it, all fawns really need after they have their injuries cared for is milk until the time that they're weaned. And we can provide that through a bottle rack so that I'm not actually holding the bottles and they don't think that I'm mother or a person is mother. We do put ear tags in their ears before we release them, and that's so we can get some follow-up information. Um, how long do they live? Where do they go? Do they stay in a group, or do they split up when they're a year old? That kind of thing is, is what we want some feedback on, because it tells us if we're doing a good job and what we can do better. It, it gives us some feedback. Rehabilitators Paul and George Ann Kyle specialize in treating chimney swifts. There's much more to wildlife rehabilitation than just taking care of uh, acute fuzzy animals. Uh, there's a lot of responsibility. Uh, you pretty much give up a lot of your free time when uh, the animals are coming in. The birds that we take care of, we have to feed every 30 minutes. Um, if they're in really bad condition, it's sometimes every 15 minutes. Most of the time, it requires um, between, I'd say, 10 to 18 hours a day at the beginning. You start out feeding them five to six times a day, um, depending on how many fawns you care for. It's hard to realize when you're in the middle of it whether you're really accomplishing anything. When you see animals come in and you try so hard and they die in your hands, it's hard to see that you're accomplishing something. Though death is not uncommon, it is the most difficult event rehabilitators must face. Half of the ones that come to me are so sick by the time they get here or by the time someone finds them that there isn't anything we can do to help them and they end up dying or they need to be euthanized. Long hours of hard work, a high mortality rate, and little or no financial assistance are the realities of animal rehabilitation. So why are these people willing to commit their time, their lives, to this difficult task? There's a real sense of satisfaction in knowing when a fawn comes in and he's so sick that he cannot even lift his head um, to get that fawn and take him from that point where he has an unstable temperature he can't even maintain his own body temperature and get him to a point where he weighs 30 pounds and is frolicking with other fawns and is ready for release. I mean, that's, that's why I do it. It's, it's fun to see the end result. Besides the personal rewards, the data that is collected from these treated animals has provided insight into what other species' needs may be. It's common knowledge that deer are an overpopulated species. So why work with an overpopulated species? When they are here, um, it gives us a wonderful opportunity to be able to learn from them, to study. When another animal comes in with fire ants, perhaps even an endangered species, how would that be cared for? And we're, we're able to learn in caring for the whitetail fawns how we would care for another um, animal. 15 to 20 times for those who are interested in caring for wild animals, an application for an animal rehabilitation permit is made through the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. People who are interested in doing wildlife rehabilitation should go into it with their eyes open. It's a, it's a commitment, sometimes a long-term commitment, an expensive commitment, and a very difficult thing to do. I suppose the big payoff is when you take a bird uh, that you've worked with for five or six weeks uh, that was just a, a little lump of protoplasm, basically when you got it, take it outside and open up your hands, it flies off. It, it's like magic. Rest up to them. The ultimate goal of animal rehabilitation is to release the treated animal back into the wild. After 
three months of care, a group of fawns is being transported to a nearby ranch, which will be its new home. You know who this is? This is your deer from downtown Kyle. That's the down deer. Okay. That's the little I feel like it's a graduation ceremony, you know, it's, um, they're, they're ready to go. Um, it's, when you have a patient in the hospital and you release them from the hospital, you don't feel sad about them going. You know that they're ready to go, you know that they're ready to get on with their lives. And that's where we are right now. They're ready to get on with their lives and so they need to do that. Some question whether the commitment and sacrifices these rehabilitators make are worth it. But for those who choose to make this their life's work, and the animals that have been given a second chance, there's little doubt that the struggle has been worthwhile. The red cockaded woodpecker has been the focal point of both controversy and cooperation. Next on The Naturalist Journal, we'll take a look at a very special bird of the pine forests. Less than 50 miles from downtown Houston is the home of the endangered red cockaded woodpecker. It gets its name from a small red patch on the sides of the head of adult males, which is only visible when they are excited or agitated. But perhaps its most distinguishing trait is the type of tree it chooses for a home. What makes this species unique is the fact that it's the only woodpecker that excavates its cavity in a live pine tree. Other species excavate in dead snags and so forth, or else use cavities excavated by other, other birds or other animals. The red cockaded woodpecker has been on the endangered species list since 1970. The woodpeckers seek trees 70 years or older and this is one reason why the birds are endangered. Since the 1870s, the old growth forests of East Texas have been cut for timber. Many of these areas were replanted and cut on a 30-year rotation. Over the years, continuing land conversion and development has left less than 2% of their original habitat. As the result of increasing public scrutiny and litigation, the U.S. Forest Service has accelerated their management for red cockaded woodpeckers. There are a number of things that we do. Some of those include prescribed burning in the colony sites, augmenting colonies, installing inserts and restrictor plates, uh, thinning in the areas around colonies to promote the growth of pine, and research is continually coming up with new and, and more innovative ways to help recover the species. One new technology provides a shortcut for establishing new colonies. In less than an hour, an artificial cavity insert in the proper habitat can provide a home that would normally take the red cockaded woodpecker two years to excavate. Private corporations can help this effort through a special funding program. It's called the Challenge Cost Share Program with the Forest Service, whereby private enterprise can provide funds and the Forest Service can obtain matching funds dollar for dollar for projects of this type. We think that we can actually create more colonies and provide additional cavities for the birds. And I project a, a big increase in the number of breeding pairs on this district. Now, 400 more artificial cavity inserts will be installed in the pine forest of East Texas. And this endangered bird will have a better chance to continue as a vibrant part of the living forest. Between Laredo and Brownsville, running along both sides of the Rio Grande, is a corridor of land rich in Texas history. The Camino Still Rio Heritage Project has begun a survey of the region's historic sites. The goal is to create a greater awareness and to preserve this vanishing legacy. This is a trip through time along that corridor. The journey begins in Laredo. 
The Texas-Mexican border is a region united by a common history. Many cultures left their mark, Indian, Spanish, Anglo. At times they clashed, but in the long run, their very survival depended on an ability to adapt and mix, resulting in a distinctive border identity. Founded in 1755, Laredo remains the oldest surviving settlement on the north bank of the river. As witnessed at the Casa Ortiz, the past coexists with the present. Built in the 1830s, the house belonged to the same family for five generations. Just 35 miles downriver from Laredo, is the small village of San Ignacio. Time and the elements are taking their toll on many of the structures here. Fortunately, this is one town that is already gaining some attention. The Texas Parks and Wildlife Department hopes to acquire two sites here, including the San Francisco Ranch and the Jesus Trevino Fort. One of the owners, Dr. R.G. Sanchez, is a direct descendant of the original inhabitants who arrived here in the early 1830s. He grew up in San Ignacio and remembers his early childhood. It was like being in paradise, I would say. Um, I was born here and uh, I lived here until I was about almost 10 years old. It was um, a very peaceful area here. You could walk anywhere, go anywhere. There was a lot of freedom. That was the, the thing that I enjoyed so much. The townspeople themselves are playing a role in the preservation of their heritage. Their church, recently damaged by a fire, is being restored to its 1916 appearance by a group of citizen volunteers. It's our church, so <laughs> to us this is the hub of our community. This is where we meet for weddings and christenings and quinceañeras and everything that we do usually starts at here in the church. At Zapata, you cross the Rio Grande into the city of Guerrero Viejo. For years, the town was accessible only by boat. Dating back to the colonial period, the town was a thriving center for commerce and culture until 1954. That was the year that the Falcon Reservoir was formed, flooding much of the town. The inhabitants were relocated by the Mexican government to the new Guerrero, nearly 30 miles away. A few stayed and continued their lives in an abandoned, isolated city, frozen in time. Approximately a dozen people still make their homes here. They are fishermen and goat herders. Some of them have lived here since their youth. Their children tend to move away to towns with electricity, running water, and jobs. Senora Julia Zamora moved to Guerrero Viejo in 1946. No, me voy con y al mismo tiempo me las traigo y vengo y hago que comer, hago tortillas en las manos y hago todo. Me gusta mucho mi ser todo. Connected now to the outside world by a road, the fate of Guerrero Viejo is unknown. Will water and neglect continue to wear away the walls and buildings? What will become of its citizens? The Camino del Rio project hopes that the town will become an international park. The town of Roma is an hour away from Zapata. Originally founded as a ranch in 1765, it grew and flourished as an inland port for river steamboats. The decline of Roma began when the railroad arrived here in the 1880s. There are numerous historic buildings here, all in various states of disrepair.
Perhaps the most outstanding structure in Roma is the aging suspension bridge built in 1928. The only remaining suspension bridge over the Rio Grande, it is in desperate need of maintenance and repair. Looking out from the Roma Bridge on a warm Sunday afternoon is a reminder that there are more ways than one to cross the river. Thirty minutes from Roma is the ferry at Los Evanos. There is evidence that this location has been a popular ford for centuries. The Spaniards crossed here in the 1740s. The Mexican army in 1846. Texas Rangers chased cattle rustlers through these waters during the 1870s. It is said that smugglers still use this crossing under the cover of darkness. Leaving the ferry at Los Evanos, you continue to Hidalgo. It is here that irrigation opened the way for the Rio Grande Valley's agricultural success. The pump house in Hidalgo is impressive for its massive scale, not to mention its role in development of the region. This pump house eventually was the source for irrigation water for approximately 70,000 acres of land to the north and to the east. Between the railroads, the coming of the railroads, and the advent of irrigation, this was turned into a literal garden, and uh, the shipment of fruits and vegetables proceeded at a great pace. Dating back to 1910, the pump station exemplifies a time when steam was king. Left to rust and scavenge for the metal, can this piece of Texas history still be salvaged? From Hidalgo, follow Highway 281 southeast to the end of the corridor. Brownsville is a town of movement and sound. It is also a town with a successful program of restoration and preservation. There is an acute awareness here as to the importance of the town's heritage. Many buildings have been rescued from decay and incorporated into the modern world. What happens when destruction of a landmark is imminent? Mark Lund came up with a unique approach. Put the structure in storage and wait until a new home for the house can be found. This was one of the original Fort Brown buildings. Uh, it was built in 1868. What happened was when the uh, GSA expanded the Gateway Bridge, building number two was torn down. And rather than have the pieces of the building end up in a landfill, what the city did was we've taken these pieces, we have them now in storage, and we hope to rebuild this building. The Rio Grande Heritage Corridor contains some of our most important historic resources, reflecting the unique diversity of our past. Too many of these sites are literally dissolving into thin air. The effort by the Camino Stil Rio project to save them has only recently begun. Hopefully, the new and united awareness of this region will keep our history from quietly disappearing into the river. The prehistoric people who once lived in Texas have left us a lasting record of their world. Next, we'll experience Texas through the rock art they left behind. The ghostly images painted and carved into these rough rock surfaces give us a rare glimpse into the lives of the ancient people who created them. With a little imagination, we can begin to understand what our Texas ancestors feared and worshipped 
how they hunted, and what their everyday lives must have been like. Texas has some of the finest examples of this art form in the United States. The Texas Parks and Wildlife Department manages four areas where you can see rock art, Big Bend Ranch State Natural Area, Devil's River State Natural Area, Waco Tank State Historical Park, and Seminole Canyon State Park. Seminole Canyon is considered to be one of the premier rock art sites in, in, on the North American continent. Seminole Canyon State Park near Del Rio offers some of the most spectacular images. It's believed these pictographs were painted more than 4,000 years ago. But in the past few decades, this artwork has been threatened with destruction. Guided tours are the only way to access the pictographs at Seminole Canyon. Waco Tanks is a very special area. You, you feel that this was a place where people came again and again and again because they were drawn to it. And I think I've come here 150 times and I, I, I just keep coming back. Waco Tanks State Historical Park near El Paso offers more recent images. It's believed this rock art dates back more than 500 years. There are several areas that are accessible to the public at Waco Tanks, but sadly, the artwork here has also been victimized by vandals. Eventually we may have to go to guided tours only there also just to protect that spectacular rock art. A guided tour is the only way to view the rock art at Devil's River State Natural Area. There are several sites similar to those found at Seminole Canyon, but here they're much more weathered and faded. The bus tour at Big Bend Ranch State Natural Area will take you to one of the many rock art sites at Big Bend. Other sites here have yet to be fully studied, but once they are, they too will likely be opened up for visitation. Hopefully we can protect them in the future. And uh, we do that by recording the sites and then allowing people to see them, but usually as a guided tour only because it's hard to keep your hands off of it but that is the primary way that rock art disappears is by just people loving on it too much. The rock art of Texas, a centuries-old legacy that will speak to future generations only if we learn to protect it today.